wanted to welcome you to our session of the Distinguished Speakers uh, in the Art of the Spanish Americas. I am Rosario Granados, the Marilyn Toma Associate Curator in the Art of the Spanish Americas at the Blanton Museum of Art. Um, some of you are have been with us uh, many times, so I don't need to tell you that this series is um, sponsored by the College of Liberal, Art, Liberal Arts, the College of Fine Arts and the School of Architecture, but maybe some of you need this little reminder. Um, today's, uh, tonight's session is uh, called um, Feminine Soundscapes, and we are happy to have Carolina Sacristán, Associate Professor in the School of Humanities and Education at the Tecnológico de Monterrey. Can you please say hi, Carolina? Hello, thank you, Rosario, for inviting me. I'm so thrilled to be here today and to share this panel with Sarah, whose work I admire so much. And Sarah Finlay, who is Associate Professor of Spanish in the Department of Modern and Classical Languages and Literatures at the Christopher New Newport University. Thank you, Rosario and Susan and Justin. I'm also really delighted to be here today and very excited to learn from Carolina. Um, and now I'm going to let you in the very good hands of Susan Dean Smith, who is Associate Professor in the History Department here at UT Austin. And uh, we, I will see you at the end of this webinar. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Thank you, Rosario. Um, and thanks to um, everyone, to our um, presenters. Um, we have a very exciting um, webinar coming up this evening. Um, and I will be moderating the panel. Before we start, um, just a few housekeeping notes for those of you uh, in the audience. Your audio is muted, uh, so no one can hear you and only the panelists are visible on screen. Closed captioning is available by clicking the live transcript icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, we'll be taking your questions from the Q&A window just click the icon below to type and send your questions. It's fine to make comments in the chat um, window, but please ask your questions um, that you want to um, send to um, Carolina and Sarah through the Q&A box. Tonight's event is being recorded and will be available on our website um, and YouTube page um, roughly from um, one week uh, today. So let's get started with our first uh, speaker. Um, Carolina Sacristán is a professor at the School of Humanities and Education at the Tecnológico de Monterrey. She holds a PhD in art history from the um, National Autonomous University of Mexico. And she is a harpsichordist who graduated in Italy. She is the author of articles exploring the links between music and the visual culture of the viceregal period. Her publications include Audible Paintings, Religious Music and Devotion to the Infancy of, of Christ in the Art of um, the Viceroyalty of Peru um, in 2019. Um, Carolina is currently working on a project on devotional music for women um, in 19th century Mexico. Um, she has an absolutely fascinating talk for us this evening, Christ Child as Guitarist, a Feminist Reading of Music iconography from New Spain. So Carolina, I'm going to turn it over to you and welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you, Rosario. So I, I'm going to um, talk about this beautiful painting. So I'm going to read the paper I prepared for you. The cross child performing on the cross is one of the most enigmatic figures in Mexican Benjamin painting. The subject is rare and we have it preserved in an anonymous canvas painted in the 1730s, which is today located in a private collection. Nothing is known about its history and the circumstances of its commission. The painting shows the Christ child surrounded by the instruments of the passion and is standing in before an intense blue background. He was the crown of thorns and many droplets are welling up from the pointing wood on his forehead he has a pair bracelet around each wrist and a necklace around his neck, which gives a sense of luxury. Nonetheless, his body is barely covered with a pair. When we observe the child, his youth increases our bewilderment. 
The first impression is that he has just left the banjo in Bethlehem, but the harsh landscape of the road that led us to think that he's about to be sacrificed, or perhaps that the passion has already occurred and Christ has resurrected transform into an infant. The five archives that say that the beholder was performing music on a guitar of souls. Given his partially open mouth, we might assume that the infant is also singing. The lyrics of the song seem to be written in the phylactery that floats over the child's head. To decrease, are the theme of my song wherever I launch. According to the Spanish Augustinian writer Alonso de Orozco, the verse comes from Psalm 118, which expresses the importance of accepting God's will, allowing this to change the suffering he imposes on the believers into joy. Or, to put it metaphorically, the verse advises the Christians to find a way to transform the suffering into music as the Christ child does in the painting. I argue that the item, items described so far are the visual elements of a sophisticated symbolism pointing to women's devotional world. The Christ child lays with the religious belief on Christ and women sharing the same musical essence. Women's souls were intended as a string musical instruments, and Christ was supposed to be a skilled musician who played music upon them. Bernard Sertz traces this idea back to the early 16th century Spain, based on the mystical visions of two Dominican tertiaries uh, that, that saw themselves transformed into a string musical instruments. Maria de Santo Domingo explained that the strings of her soul were the virtues, and that Christ had tuned her string through his blood to keep Suki he could play upon them. Juan de la Cruz narrated an extraordinary conversation in which Christ asked her if she would experience the pain of the passion. She responded that she would do whatever he pleased. Christ embraced her, and Juana began to feel limp in Spain as if her body had become the strings and pegs from Abihuela. Christ played upon Juana, crafting a piece of harmonious music from her suffering. Several elements are woven into this image. The women's souls of the string musical instruments, Christ as a musician, pain as music, and the passion as a musical event. This topic continues to prevail in religious literature from the late 17th and, early, and the early decades of the 15th century in Spain. In 1697, in response to a sermon preached to the nuns of the convent of Santa Inés in Puebla, Juan Antonio Lovato stated that the laments of Mary resounded like a string musical instrument after seeing Christ on the cross. In 1723, an anonymous friar wrote a devotional booklet for the Clarice nuns of Coreta in the central region of New Spain. The booklet titled Cita Leonosa para la Música Espiritual al Niño Dios was issued in Mexico City on the initiative of Sor Maria Magdalena de San Jose at the time, consular to the Aves in the convent of Santa Clara. The nun dedicated the booklet to her sisters. Tita Almoniosa compares the style of the nuns with an ancient Greek Sifara tune of a program of prayer. The meditation on the episode of the fight to Egypt was meant to enhance the virtues, which were the strings of the soul through spiritual suffering. Each string was supposed to have a different sound. In order to complete the harmony, the booklet encourages the nuns to sing with their voices accompanied by the music of their spiritual sitaras. I posit that the religious belief of women's souls as a string instruments inspired the making of religious images for nuns that evoke the musical sound of the resurrected Christ. In Spain, in 1635, Domingo de la Rioja carved the Cristo de la Victoria inspired by the vision of the Augustinian recollect nun Isabel de Jesus. She declared that Christ appeared standing before her with the cross against his, with the cross against his chest. According to Fernando Rodriguez de la Flor, such bodily pleasure recalls Christ's characterized as office playing upon the cross transfigured into a harp, as described by Pedro Calderón de la Barca in El Morfeo. It is worth noting that the Cristo de la Victoria and the Divine Orfeo are visual adaptations of St. Augustine's commentary on Psalm 56, which describes Christ as two ancient Greek string instruments fused by the resurrection, the sitara and the psaltery. We may assume that the Christ child is an iconographical variant of the resurrected Christ, as suggested by Luis Robledo's diary. 
the child sings and plays music upon the cross, resting his foot on the skull as if it were a guitar stool, like the anonymous 15th century sculpture representing the infant Jesus, which is held in the convent of Santa Clara de la Real in the Spanish city of Murcia. Only the phylactery with the verse in Latin floating over the child's head seems to be missing in the Spanish sculpture. Still, there is a chance that the clarest notes associated the child's gestures to the singing of the sun, as did probably the visitation sisters in France. St. Francis of Sales wrote letters to the visitation nuns in which he described Christ as a sun singing to religious women from the day of the cross. For its part, Cayetano Antonio de Torres, a canon of Mexico City Cathedral, recommended the Salesian writings to the Capuchin nuns of the convent of San Felipe de Jesus, to whom he was closely related. Maya said that the Christ child belonged to a woman bearing in mind the evidence that has been presented so far. The painting implies that women were sensitive to Christ's music even in this assumption challenge the traditional Western hierarchy of the senses, which tend to associate the rational senses of sight and hearing with men. By alluding to the musical likeness between Christ and women, the canvas encouraged women's spiritual perfection. This was not a task easily accomplished, since it depended on the intellectual ability of the beholder to decode several symbols. The Christ art was lightly copied from two interrelated one of the strings is a good word placed between the introduction and the music contained in the Libro de Musica de Vihuela intitulado El Maestro by Luis de Milan. The woodcut represents Orpheus performing on the Vihuela. In both images, the main character stands in the center of the composition, looking straight to the beholder. The position of the arms on the upper part of the body are similar, nevertheless. The fetal position differently because the infant imitates the guitar playing technique documented in the manual by Andres de Soto issued in 1764. The cross has five strings instead of six compared with Office's Vihuela. The depiction of the cross as a guitar suggests either a familiarity with the five guitar, which at an age is given her name, the Spanish Sifara or a later print of all this playing upon the guitar that has not been located yet. Matthews, in performing on the vihuela, empties the humanist thought of the Renaissance, which associated the vihuela with an ancient Greek life. In contrast, the Christ child is in line with the Baroque tradition of the Brazilian images, which the evidence of physical damage and loneliness appear to the viewer's sympathy. This train results from a sophisticated transposition of symbolic meanings that only a devotee with a final understanding may have been able to decode. They are not a simple exchange of visual elements. The Christ child follows the principles of the 17th century analogical model of thinking that the literary theorists of conceptismo, the Spaniard uh, Jesuit Baltasar Gracian, brilliantly expounded in Agudeza y Arte de Ingenio a uh, book published in, 16, in 1642. The canvas expresses a highly complex idea in a compact and compelling form. The child musician of the Passion symbolizes the Eucharist by asserting the likeness between Christ and Orpheus. For early Christians, Orpheus, the mythic musician of the Greeks, who charmed Pluto and Persephone with a song to rescue his wife and Christ, share relevant features. Both were half human and half God. They both descended to the underworld and returned, and they were both murdered with violence. Saint Clement of Alexandria, a theologian born in Athens to a pagan family, presents Christ as an improved Orpheus in the Protracticus. He juxtaposes the music of Orpheus, which represents traditional Greek music, against the music of Christ, and calls the latter the new song. The theologian uses this musical image to explain that the force of persuasion of the united world, meaning, uh, the meaning, meaning Christ, extends beyond the world itself. In the 17th century, the Jesuits in Flanders developed the analogies taken from St. Clement's work. They created an emblem titled Communion Generale, which represents all his performing on the guitar, which is a fat instrument from the Renaissance that resembles a guitar. Well, uh, 
work is performed on the git and uh, while bringing you ideas out from Hades. Under the image, there is a quotation from the Indian Senate. If Orpheus could summon the shadow of his wife relying on a Thracian sitara and its million strings, um, immediately after it, there is an anagram that completes the meaning of the verses. The sitara, the sitara of Jesus is the Eucharist. The emblem's epigram shows that the Jesus is connected the transformative properties that St. Clement attributed to their new son with the figure of Orpheus and the Eucharist as a symbol of the crucified Christ with a string musical instrument. In this line, Baltasar Gracian uh, suggested that the laments of Jesus on the cross were the harmonious music of Asifara. The idea of Christ as the mystic Sithara will be inspired the composition of a brilliant secret for the blessed sacrament, which was set into fold by music by the Spaniard composer. Uh, Jose de Castro de Villamador at the end of the 17th century. The piece titled Can Musica Divina Survive sent to a copy made by an anonymous nun from the convent of La Santissima Trinidad in the city of Puebla in Spain in the early 18th century. The well preserved manuscript from the Colección Sanchez Garza in Mexico City bears the marks indicating that the Villa Cico was performed on several occasions. Uh, due to time constraints, I will, I will not analyze um, either the poem or the music in depth, but I will share uh, with you one of the couplets with revealing verses supporting my argument. This is coupla number four, Misterio Sabiguela, al herirle sus cuerdas una lanza, su sagrada armonía se vio así de siete órdenes formada, which might be translated as Mysterious Viguela, meaning Christ, when a lance wounded or plucked to your strings because to, the verb to you was a cinema for to pluck in the 18th and 17th century. Then when a lance uh, plucked to your strings, that's Christ's body, whose sacred harmony was thus informed by seven courses. Courses is a symbol for strings, but it's also interpreted as sound. And I believe that those seven sounds might be the last seven words of Jesus on the, um, on the cross. Um, let's hear the let's hear the music here. Right. The crush card is an instructive analogy unifying the intellectual and religious experience. Oh, sorry, I missed this, uh, something before this. Based on the complexity of the poem and the appealing music rhetoric of the opening section of the Viencito, I assert that Cassidy's composition manifests an honest religious attachment to the Eucharist through the same form of intellectual devotion embodied by the crush eye in the painting. The crush eye is an instructive analogy unifying the intellectual and religious experience with a real visual concept adapted to serve a woman's few pious necessities. One of the significant adaptations is the depiction of Christ as a child wearing pearls. It has been found that the images of the Christ child were often the personal property of women who dress them in removable costumes or jewels, pray bracelets and necklaces were generally worn by sculptures that belonged to the convent of Jesus Maria in Mexico City, as proved by the account of the pastoral visit conducted by the Archbishop Pablo Rivera in 1672. The figure of the infant further supports the Eucharistic meaning of the image, which revisits the medieval theological tradition of fusing the incarnation and the passion by visually merging the baby Jesus of Bethlehem and the sacramental victim of the Mass. The Christ child brings together the childhood's motive 
and the Eucharist as a musical instrument in the manner of the 17th century Spanish conceptism. For this reason, I assume that the painting served as a devotional tool for a particular type of woman. She was most likely a nun, uh, trained in music and bonded with the Jesuits. I would suggest someone like the Franciscan Tasha in Mariana de Jesus Flores y Paredes, also known as La Cecena de Quito, who was exceptionally skilled in performing on both the vihuela and the guitar. Her personal confessor was the Jesuit painter Hernando de la Cruz. Another possibility is that the image belonged to a woman who understood the attunement of the soul as an essential attribute of virtuous women. Perhaps that woman was familiar with both the hagiographies of Mariana de Jesus Flores and San Rosa of Lima. The Jesuit Leonardo Hansen writes that Rosa used to play upon the cithara or the guitar as an act of mystical contemplation. The cithara represented the Franciscan tertiary self and the mystic sultry of his music attuned with her symbolized the child Jesus. Moreover, the female owner of the painting could have known that the Carmelite nun St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi was supposed to have had a musical religious experience similar to the vision of St. Rosa. One day, Mary Magdalene felt a deep desire of seeing Christ resurrected. Hence, she summoned him, reciting Psalm 57, which says, Awake me, glory, awake, Salvary and Sithara. Suddenly, she understood that Christ resurrected, transfigured into a musical instrument whose strength represented the tolerance of the passion. After having this revelation, Christ appeared and talked to her. In my view, by the victim, the resurrected Christ as a shy musician surrounded by the instruments of the passion, the painting combines the visions of both saints, Rosa and Mary Magdalene. The campus creates the illusion of a whole new mystical vision for the beholder, perceptible to the eyes, audible to the spiritual ear, and permanent in the material world. If possible female owner or even painter aside, the image of Christ's child invokes sound to remember the importance of music for a spiritual transcendence. The challenge to the viewer to notice or revictor in connections between symbols that resemble each other as the strings of a musical instrument providing an extraordinary entrance to the realm of women's religious devotion in the 18th century in New Spain. Thank you. Carolina, thank you. Um, absolutely um, stunning. That, that, that image is just exquisite. And you do such an amazing job um, at contextualizing, contextualizing the image, but also contextualizing the meaning, the reading, and how how we approach it. Um, so, so many questions. Um, I'm going to ask you just one quick follow up question um, before we move on to Sarah, um, and then we'll be able to come back to more um, more discussion of, of your wonderful presentation. Um, uh, I was really struck by uh, your use of conceptismo, um, and you invoke um, Balthazar Gracian in, in this. And so um, it also seems very integral to how you're approaching this, this painting. Could you, could you just comment briefly on, um, on why, why and how you're using conceptismo here? Yes, true. I... I think that conceptismo is relevant for understanding complex paintings because it allows us to better understand the logical mechanism of the early modern way of thinking, which involves linking through analogies all sorts of literary, visual, and musical sources of information. Uh, in the early modern period, the analogy was not only a linguistic expression or a rhetorical figure, but a complex cognitive process of transferring meanings from a particular subject to another to bring out and finally grasp which was supposed to be the true essence of things. I would say that um, analogical thinking is a way of reasoning, understanding, and interpreting the world. And the paper that I read for you meant to be an example of how conceptismo might be applied to interpret a painting. And this also reveals the importance of interdisciplinarity throughout history, because basically 
I used a literary theoretical framework to analyze a painting related to music that hadn't been fully understood. When I saw the Prashai musician for the first time, I remained very impressed. I felt in love with him immediately, and I wondered why there was such a little biography about such an interesting artwork. And then, uh, going forward with my research, I realized that there were many, many symbols in the painting. And in order to discover their meanings and possible connections, I needed to learn to think as people did in the 17th century. And Balthasar Sargassian taught me how to do that. Really. Okay. Great, Abs absolutely fascinating, and so so much more. Um, but the emphasis on the um, interdisciplinarity too, I think, is 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 absolutely absolutely key here. Um, but we, maybe we can um, continue this um, discussion um, later on. Um, we're going to turn to our uh, second uh, presenter, Sarah Finley. Hi, Sarah. Um, Sarah is Associate Professor of Spanish at Christopher Newport University. Her 2019 book, Hearing Voices, Orality and New Spanish Sound Culture in Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, explores sound in the work of um, Mexican poet and nun, Sor Juana. Um, her subsequent research examines connections between Sor Juana and her musical patron, the uh, Countess of Villa Ambrosa. Articles from this project are forthcoming in the um, Revista de Estudios Hispano Hispanicos and also in the um, Revista Canadienses de Estudios Hispanicos. Um, Sarah's talk today relates to her uh, current work on harmony and Afro-descent in 17th and 18th century Biencicos, um, a Baroque genre that combines poetry and music and that we'll be um, hearing much more about. Um, and I have to say, Sarah, um, I, I've read a lot of titles in my time. You have given me the tongue twister of a title, so I hope I can get through this without massacring it. Um, and so uh, Sarah's uh, presentation is Remixing the Phoenix, Afro Descent in Rack, Rick, Racks, Tumba, La La La, Los Viencicos Negros de Sor Juana. Sarah. Fantastic, thank you very much. And thank you to Carolina for a really fascinating presentation. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. In Romance Ocho, one of three lyrics for singing, new Spanish poet and nun, Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, reflects upon the experience of voice and self-hearing. The poem recounts the tale of Narcisa, a feminized Narcissus. At first, Narcissa's vocalizations are a sign of her agency, for they are powerful enough to harmonize the sun, stars, and all the cosmic elements, as you can see here. Nevertheless, when the subject's song reflects back to her, the results are fatal, and we see that here. Precisely, Hearing one's own voice echoed as acousmatic sound disrupts several foundations of Western subjectivity, the distinction between self and other, as well as tentative links between voice and identity. The result is an endless chain of resignification that underscores the vocal utterance, and by extension the self it represents, as a performative event whose echoic residue opens to transformation. Now, while Manarsissa may not have failed so, fared so well, Romance Ocho illustrates how sonic resonance can amplify voices beyond the textual bounds of the poetic self, particularly in some pieces like this one. Indeed, the auditory reworking of the Ovidian myth highlights voices ontological centrality here and throughout the lyrics that the poet penned for Son Repertoire, the theater, and Villancicos, popular musical poetic song cycles that accompany the liturgy on feast days. Lamentably, there are almost no extant scores or resources for studying the performance context of Sor Juana's staged works. As a result, most prior studies of these pieces rely on literary and historical methods that privilege the written word as locus of meaning, with little or superficial consideration of the text relationship to accompany musical or theatrical elements. In the face of these lacunae, self-conscious reflections upon orality in some pieces like Romance Ocho 
highlight Sor Juana's sonorous engagement with her writing and beckon further exploration of sound-based practices as critical modes of inquiry. Today, I will examine a creative project that resounds Afro-descent in Sor Juana's Villancicos. And this is the Mexican sound collective Rack Rick Rack's 2008 recording, Tumba la la la, Los Villancicos Negros de Sor Juana. This album includes lyrics from the poets, we call them the poets Black Villancicos or Villancicos de Negro. It's a subgenre that features stilted representations of Afro-descendant characters, toponyms, racialized musical and dance forms, cultural references to particular foods or occupations, and of course, the literary style known as Black speech, habla de negros, all contribute to the Villancicos constructions of Blackness. Tumba la la la, a contemporary recording, samples Sor Juana's lyrics with Latin jazz, notable for its African-American and Afro-Latin underpinnings, bossa nova, samba, and other Afro-diasporic styles. The album closes with a 20-minute soundscape from Quajiniquilapa, a town with strong Afro-descended roots in Mexico's Costa Chica region. Tumba la Lala has received little critical attention, no doubt due in part to the marginalization of Afro-descent in narratives of Mexican nationalism. However, the project recently gained visibility, thanks in particular to references in Nick Jones' reading of Sor Juana as a Black Atlantic writer. Jones interprets Tumba la Lala through the lens of Afro-mestizaje, maintaining that it illuminates how both Mexican and Mexican-American rap music and the musicalized form of Alla de Negros in Villancicos facilitate a blending of cultural influences. Along these lines, he underscores driving polyrhythm, references to dance forms, and the mixture of disparate musical elements as examples of Afro-mestizaje that relate to both Afro-diasporic and Baroque cultural expression. Today, I will develop Joan's observations further by reflecting upon how the album resounds Black and African voices in Sor Juana's Villancicos beyond the limits of the written archive. Echo is a central theme in my argument, for Tumba la 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 is filled with reverberations and reflective vocalizations whose echoic nature challenges the listener to hear her own voice in the Afro-diasporic remix. As Gary Tomlinson and Ana Maria Ochoa Gautier have shown, it can be difficult to recover non-European voices and sounds from documents and visual art intended to muffle or silence them. Tomlinson grapples with the limits of logocentric thought when faced with non-European auditory interventions, which he argues exceed Western definitions of voice and resist lettered reproduction. He seeks to access early Amerindian song whose practices and philosophies are obscured unsatisfyingly in Eurocentric accounts. In response, Tomlinson interrogates the letter itself, arguing that European writing systems are inadequate for capturing the sound-based ideologies that informed autochthonous sound practices in the Americas. For her part, Ochoa Gauthier takes a phonographic approach to the archive. She observes that many of the acoustic dimensions of the colonial and early post-colonial archive are not presented to us as discrete transcribed works or as forms neatly packaged into identifiable genres. They are instead interspersed, excuse me, dispersed into different types of written inscriptions that transduce different audile techniques into specific label, legible sound objects of expressive culture. Ochoa Gautier's comparison of archival writing and recording technologies is helpful for thinking about how we might attend more fully to Afro-descendant sounds in the Villancico scripted materials. If these pieces harmonize black bodies and voices with the racial imaginaries of peninsular and Creole elite, as Jeffrey Baker affirms, is a decolonial resounding possible? Would such an endeavor embrace boisterous dissonance, a recurrent auditory sign of blackness in archival sources and in the Villancicos? Or would it respond more subtly, like Tina Kampf says when she talks about, quote, lower frequencies of transfiguration? In Tumba La La La, Echo is a useful lens for understanding how the album resounds Afro descent. The trope is persistent throughout the recording. However, it particularly stands out in the ninth track, Señor Andrea, Señor Tomé. And I'll play it momentarily, but first I'd like to talk a bit about the poetry. This piece reimagines the seventh Viancico from Sor Juana's attributable set for the 1678 Christmas liturgy in the Puebla Cathedral. It opens 
with an echoic dialogue between two characters of Afro descent. And I think I, I've learned this from Emily Bergman. I think it's very important to read these texts because there's a completely different auditory context. Ah, señor Andrea. Ah, señor Tomé. Tenemos guitarra. Guitarra tenemos. Sabemos tocaya. Tocaya sabemos. Que me conta lo que ve. Here, the reflective structure causes the listener to wonder if señor Andrea truly knows how to play the guitar or if his affirmation is simply an inverted echo of Senor Tomé's query, a simple refraction of the sound. Lyrical echoes in the villancico allude to a phonocentric process of meaning making that exists beyond language's semantic limits. In this way, Sor Juana's text prepares Rack Rick Rack's echoic resounding some 330 years later. Continuing, Senor Andrea and Senor Tomé describe their musical contributions to the nativity celebration, which is one of my favorite parts of this biancico. They commemorate Jesus' birth with guitarra y panderillo, and also take part in festivities through song. Despite this apparent assimilation to Christian practices, however, Sor Juana's text contrasts the figure's musical interventions with what they call white harmonies. The Afro-descendant characters negatively describe their own singing, and they affirm, Sando ronca y resfriara, cantalemo mal, señole. Later, señor Andrea and señor Tomé distinguish their voices from European and Euro-descendant counterparts. They say, De lo branco no guardemo, que tosemo a lo yaco. Consequently, the negrillo highlights vocal timbre as a marker of racial identity echoing one of the main constructions that Nina Sun Eidsheim interrogates in her 2019 study of the conflations of voice and race. And I'd like to pause here before I start talking about the reinvention to play a bit of that music. And so it sounds something like this. <laughs> That should give enough of an idea to, and of course we have the link so you can listen to it later on. So through auditory reflections and reverb, Rack Rick Rack's remix, which is, I found surprising the first time I heard it, amplifies the echoic and timbral othering, so to speak, that takes place in Sor Juana's lyrics. The piece opens with clanging church bells, an auditory symbol of ecclesiastical authority in Viceregal Mexico. Within seconds, a rapid heartbeat-like pulse drowns out the bells and resituates the villancico in a different soundscape. The two characters' dialogue follows, set against a percussive background that also features female echoes, laughter, later their animal-like sounds, son, and unintelligible speech. Stereophonic techniques, achieved by recording sounds in different channels, amplify the text's echoic structure and draw out the overlapping voices that the lyrics encode. In a glossolalian cacophony, Rack Rick Rack's heightened uses of reflected voice recall the written archives marginalization of non-European sounds and also uncover the pluravocity that Western writing and meaning making sometimes suppresses. 
Resoundings, like in Señor Andrea, Señor Tomé, are a significant part of Tumbala Lala's amplification of Afro descent in the Black Villancicos. Their relevance is particularly evident in light of the manner in which echo disorders the linear narratives that underlie Western history. Like Sor Juana's Narcissan reworking in Romance Ocho illustrates, the acousmatic reflected utterance disrupts imagined continuity between voice and identity by enabling the speaker to experience her own sonic alterity. Furthermore, as the disembodied audible remnant of a previous utterance, reverberation evokes Jacques Derrida's revenant, a ghostly manifestation that bids us to listen to ourselves listening to the past, quote, by speaking at the same time, several times, and in several voices. For Derrida, engaging the revenant is an act of audition that exceeds Western historicization, and its untimeliness enables past and future to coexist in the same moment. The philosopher affirms, one does not know if the expectation prepares the coming of the future to come, or if it recalls the repetition of the same. Read through a Dervidian lens, echo thus derives meaning from the expectation of its return and the potential for resounding. In an album like Tumba La La La, which manipulates sound to exploit its echoic possibilities, the sonorous asynchronicity of reverberation opens the past to resignification and thus to the restitution of voices lost. In closing, I'd like to take a moment to reflect upon the broader potential of sonic modes of inquiry in text-based disciplines like literature, history, or even musicology. Among other inspirations, my remarks today owe much to artist, curator, and scholar Mark V. Campbell's comparison between the DJ and the archivist. For Campbell, remixing responds to the limits of historical narratives, particularly in post-colonial contexts. He observes, first, the use of DJing technique honors Afro-diasporic cultures by refusing to disconnect histories of Afrosonic and oral innovation, such as legacies of call and response, improvisation, and reposition. Second, these performances gesture toward the transparent embedding of Afro-diasporic oral and sonic innovations by curators, archivists, and DJs, not solely as aesthetics, but also as ways to interrupt, undo, and rethink the colonial residues of archives. Along the same lines, Tumba La 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 makes clear the possibilities of remixing as a creative and critical mode for attending to Black and African voices in Sor Juana's Villancicos. While it may be impossible to access the actual sounds of Afro descent that Spanish and Creole authored writing and code, resampling attends to their affective and cultural contours and also heightens the DJ historian's awareness of her own listening positionality and its undeniable role in making sense of voice and its echoes. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, again, another absolutely um, wonderful, very provocative um, presentation. Uh, one quick um, follow-up question, um, and then um, we can have you talk to one another. Um, uh, I have uh, many more, many more questions and hopefully we'll have some um, audience intervention here. Um, I'm, I'm really struck by um, your use of the audio racial. And um, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about um, also the musical symbolism in, in Sor Juana's um, text and, and, and just walk us through that a, a little bit more. Sure. Um, so this is part of a, a larger product to explore what I'm calling audio racial um, representation of Afro descent in these villancicos. Um, the way that they've traditionally been explored is either from a text-based uh, approach, right, that's rooted in literature and rooted in looking at the lyrics, or there's some really wonderful work on the symbolism of the music itself, of the scores itself. And when I sat down and looked at them, what I'm really interested in is the fact that there are a number of musical tropes associated with these Afro-descendant characters. So in the Villancico that we looked at, we noticed, for example, that Señor Andrea and Señor Tomé, they play a guitar and a tambourine, mm. which I find to be particularly interesting because these are instruments, and these are instruments that Afro-descendant characters play throughout the Villancicos that I've been looking at, not only in Sor Juana, but in other authors as well. Um, and they tend to be instruments that are often associated with the lower classes, but not necessarily 
in the Americas and also in the peninsula. And so what's happened is there's a grafting of a tradition that's come from the peninsula into the Americas. So sometimes we can read them through sort of an ethnographic lens and say, this gives us information about these characters. But we always have to be cautious about that from my perspective, because sometimes they're simply tropes of representation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, 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 that's really interesting because um, again, turning to another genre with um, with which I'm, I'm much more familiar, um, which is the Custer paintings. And of course you um, uh, showed one of those um, with the, um, uh, with the uh, guitar included uh, in, in that. Um, musical instruments don't feature that frequently, but, but when they do, um, I have yet to see a non-Spaniard playing a violin. Um, there are uh, uh, several where clearly it is, um, you know, either a peninsula or a criollo Spaniard who is who is who is playing a, um, a violin, um, or in in one case um, a, a Spanish woman um, at what I believe is a, is a, is a harpsichord. So that that's kind of a, a again the echo uh, echo effect there between between those two aspects. Um, uh, Christina, can I call you back in, please, to join us in this conversation? Um, so again, I mean, just uh, really reading and listening to these two um, presentations collectively, they they offer um, multiple approaches into recuperation of silenced voices, silenced meanings or obscured um, meanings. And so, I mean, first of all, I want to ask um, if you have questions for each other at this point, or if you, uh, we just continue to continue our, our conversation. I'm happy to continue the conversation. <laughs> 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 Okay, well, let, let me, uh, let me start, because um, I think this also may be useful for um, the uh, the audience, it'll certainly be useful um, for me. Um, both of you refer to Villancicos, and, and I know, Carolina, in some of your, your other work, um, you, you have kind of a very particular um, uh, take on, on Villancicos, um, that they can't necessarily just be interpreted as transgressive, for example, um, or sort of as, as burlesque. So talk to us a little bit more about um, how, you, how you understand the Villancicos and how, how we might understand them and, and, and their performativity. Well, the first thing, I, I'm going to switch to Spanish because I feel more comfortable with it when I talk about these things. So, um, eh, bueno, cuando hablamos de villancicos, o sea, la primera cosa que hay que entender es que los villancicos se tocaban en muchísimos momentos, ¿no? Eh, primero, eh, dentro del contexto de las catedrales, porque era eh, donde los conocemos más, porque sabemos que formaban parte de la liturgia, sobre todo de los maitines. Pero ha habido muchas eh, investigaciones que han demostrado que los villancicos se tocaban también en otros momentos de las prácticas religiosas. ¿no? Me refiero a momentos como, por ejemplo, las procesiones o las profesiones de las monjas, pero también sabemos que había algunos que se tocaban en horas litúrgicas que no necesariamente estaban vinculadas con los maitines. Había villancicos de estercia, por ejemplo, o ¿no? de novena, he visto algunos en los archivos, y otra cosa que es eh, muy interesante es que estos villancicos, bueno, no podemos decir que tengan, a ti como tú dices, usan solamente una perspectiva o una manera de mostrarse. Sí que son muy llamativos y muy interesantes los villancicos que juegan con este repertorio, eh, con este repertorio que es más eh, cómico, pero había también otros tipos de villancicos. Había villancicos que eran mucho más dramáticos, que abordaban temas... Eh, por ejemplo, uno que me ha llamado mucho la atención a lo largo de estos años es la cuestión de los villancicos de lágrimas, donde se llora muchísimo en muchas fiestas. Bueno, otra cosa que es importante que saber como contexto ahora que dije en las fiestas es que estos villancicos eh, se tocaban por lo general en las fiestas más importantes de las catedrales y de las iglesias del mundo hispano. Entonces, prácticamente todas las fiestas importantes tenían estos... Eh, 
estos villancicos como parte del repertorio que las hacía eh, más solemnes. Thank you. Um, Sarah? I think that one of the really interesting things from my perspective to keep in mind about the villancicos is that we sometimes we have difficulty categorizing them as a genre because they belong to the Baroque spectacle, right? So, so they are, and this is what I appreciated so much about your presentation, Carolina, was the way that you talked about the connections among music and literature and visual art. Um, and the, the longer I work, the more I think that that's how we have to look at Baroque culture. And the Viancicos are an excellent example of this. And one of the things that I think makes them so challenging um, is that most of us today are not trained in all of those disciplines. And so it's very difficult, particularly in the case of Sor Juana, which is sort of my home base. We look at these Viancico texts, but really they belong to a much richer repertoire, right? Aurelio Tejo talks about the fact for example, that many of the Viancicos poets would do things like write jokes or challenges in there for the composers. So they would use musical imagery, something that Sor Juana does quite well um, in her other writing. And then the composers would be expected to respond musically to this imagery. So if they put do re mi in there, the composer is expected to follow that. It's more difficult to access these materials to say nothing of the performativity without the proper archival context. And particularly in the case of Sor Juana, without the scores, we have to devise different ways to understand that relationship between text and performance. And um, if I, I can also follow, follow up on there and, and with your, um, the particular um, fascinating um, methodology, um, Sarah, um, that, that you have discussed with us this afternoon, um, can you, Talk us through a little bit more about sort of um, other possible sources for, for, for recuperation. And I mean, I, I am just absolutely um, sort of uh, really fascinated by the, uh, the, the idea of, of what you describe as remixing and, 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 and re um, So um, tell us a little bit more, more about that and, and sort of where you see other, other, other possibilities. Sure. So this is a project um, I, I found in recent years that it's helpful to reflect upon how this project developed. And this is very much a project that developed for me during the pandemic. Um, I live in, in Virginia, on the coast of Virginia, and that was the first time that I'd ever been here an entire summer. And so it was a really good opportunity for me to think about how my approach to Sor Juana from the Virginia side of things, how that relates not only to my community, but also to the way that I hear Sor Juana. And I think many of us, our experience of Sor Juana is that we hear her in a particular way. And what that's led to is this project. And so I'm doing two different things. There are resources for recuperating Afro-descendant voices, um, but they're few and far between. For example, we have the case of two um, enslaved singers. One is in the Puebla Cathedral, and we have a really fascinating case in the Mexico City Cathedral of an enslaved black singer who actually was able to buy his freedom. It, it's fascinating. And so these kinds of documents can tell us a lot. Likewise, Inquisition documents can tell us quite a bit about the attitudes towards Afro-descendant sounds and festivities. But we always have to think about this idea that we're coming at these Viancicos through sort of what I'm calling a double veil, right? A double veil of representation where on one hand, they're already veiled by the peninsular, the Creole perspective that they're offering because the fact that they were authored by elite authors. And likewise, we're bringing our own cultural ideas to the Viancicos. And so I'm, I'm trying to be very deliberate about the way that we hear them and to cause reflection upon that. Um, one of the things that I thought about doing, for example, and I'm working with a colleague here, is to write a sonic essay that actually would talk back to you. Um, so the Viancicos have these amazingly rich descriptions of timbre, of the sound of Afro-descendant voices. And what we'd like to do is read them into an essay and actually ask the person who's listening to the essay to make a sound. And then we'll play a sound from a library. And I haven't figured out how to get away from sort of the, the control of making that library well, in response yes. to the sound. When you do, get back to us, Sarah, please. <laughs> <I know. laughs> um, and uh, I think we have time for a couple of more questions um, that um, I don't see anything in the Q&A, so I'm just going to keep going. Um, Carolina, um, I, I have to ask you this because, uh, and again, coming back to this, this amazing, amazing painting. Um, 
And, and given, given your emphasis on what you describe um, and execute so beautifully, um, which is a feminist, a feminist reading, tell us a little bit more about your speculations um, of the patron and the painter. Um, I must confess that there is not any documental evidence for it. It is a hypothesis drawn from the visual and symbolic analysis of the image that I have shared with you. That this is a fact, and everything, according to me, everything is pointing to a female patron. The idea of that a female painter might have painted it is just an speculation too, because I really don't know what, what else can be if we have all these proofs. I mean, I actually, um, I would like to say, and I would like that very much, to say that this painting belonged to Sor Juana, but uh, unfortunately, it is too late to be hers. It, it's, oh, it's too late. Oh, the, it's too late to be hers. Yes, yes. Because yes. um, it was painted um, in around the 1730s. Uh, okay, absolutely fascinating. Um, Let's push that though a little bit more, <laughs> if, 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 if we can. Even though it's too late, why would you like to say it belonged to Sor Juana? Um, because of the complexity of the image. I mean, we have a painting full of symbols with that did um, that required to know many about many sources, not only literary sources but also theological, uh, theologic, theological sources. You have to know so many, so many things to under, fully understand the meaning of the painting. That I believe that only a learned known could have done that or could have asked for that because it's such a it's such a difficult um, image to interpret. That's what I think. Okay, just absolutely, absolutely wonderful. But I'm, but I really don't know. I really don't know. Well, we um, it we we appreciate the insights that that you have um, given us, and as, as as I said, it's very hard to get that image out of out of one's one's head. Um, we unfortunately, obviously, we could go on. There are so many more issues here. Um, I want to thank you both very much and um, thank our um, audience. Um, Rosario uh, is here. She is going to um, wrap up um, this webinar um, with some announcements. Um, and I will say um, thank you and good evening. Thank you, the three of you. I think um, it was a, a fantastic evening and a fantastic way as well to celebrate uh, women culture by two amazing female scholars and you, Susan, as, as our moderator. I wanted to um, invite our audience. We're going to have on uh, March 16th, another great free online event as part of our Curated Conversation series. Our deputy director, Carter E. Foster, and musician Terry Allen will delve into songwriting, theater, and drawing and discuss, and discuss Allen's creative process and storytelling. And this is important for the Blanton audience because we have currently an exhibition um, of, of Allen's um, artwork at the Blanton. If you have not seen it, uh, please. Uh, come visit. Um, I'm also would like to invite our audience to our next um, Distinguished Visiting Speaker Series. Um, uh, we're going to have on April 28th, um, la, uh, Dr. Luisa Elena Alcala from La Universidad Autónoma de Madrid and Do Dr. Matthew Restall from Penn State University, helping uh, Susan and me um, talk about how recent debates on racism, decolonization, and cultural patrimony uh, are shaping new research and museum displays uh, in the art of the Spanish Americas. Uh, I think we just heard a fantastic way of combining contemporary debates into uh, the, our knowledge of the past. Um, so beyond that, I also would like to invite our audience to become a member of the Blanton Museum. You are seeing the, the link uh, on, on your screen, blantonmuseum.org-membership. Uh, and we also would like to invite you to sign up for our Blanton 
um, newsletter. Uh, you can always um, then know what is going on. We have a lot of online events and um, this is a fantastic way to connect with audiences across geographies. And finally, if you have enjoyed tonight's event, please help us continue to bring quality programming to our community by making a donation at blantonmuseum.org. Uh, pay what you wish. Um, thanks again for everybody who joined us. And thanks again to our amazing speakers who really enlighten us on other ways in which we can understand the activities of nuns in New Spain. Thank you so much and really looking forward to seeing you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.